Matter before the court, the state of Minnesota versus Derek Michael Chauvin. District Court file number is 27 CR 1246 Matters on for sentencing. Counsel, note your appearances beginning with the state. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Matthew Frank, Assistant Attorney General on behalf of the state. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Jerry Blackwell for the state of Minnesota. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Steve Slisher on behalf of the state of Minnesota. Your Honor, Keith Ellison, Attorney General on behalf of the state of Minnesota. And for the defense. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Eric Nelson and Amy Voss appearing on behalf of uh, Mr. Chauvin. Thank you. Uh, we are still, uh, for all those attending, under somewhat modified COVID restrictions, so we are asking that everyone keep their masks on unless they are speaking. I'll ask for people who are speaking uh, to come up to the lectern and use the microphones and please to remove your mask so that we can hear you clearly uh, and also to maintain the distances that we have set out in the courtroom. Uh, with that, we'll proceed first with the state. Mr. Blackwell, you may proceed with victim input. Your Honor, we have four victim impact statements. Uh, we will start uh, with the seven-year-old daughter of uh, George Floyd, uh, Gianna Floyd, who will uh, present hers by video. What do you miss most about your daddy? Well, I ask about him all the time. Mm. And that's kind of it. Yeah. Well, when you ask about him, what are you asking about? Well, I was asking... How did my dad get hurt? Do you wish that he was still here with us? Yeah, but he is. Through his spirit? Yes. Yes. And when you see your daddy again one day, what do you want to do when you see him? I want to play with him. What kind of games do you want to play with them? Um, I want to um, play with him, have fun, go on a plane ride, go, um, and that's it. Yeah. Would you... we, used to, we used to have dinner meals every single night before we went to bed. My, uh, my daddy always used to help me brush my teeth. Oh. Do you miss him helping brush your teeth? Yes. How do you hope that the world remembers him? Well, they help him because um, those mean people did something to him. Yeah. If you could say anything to your daddy right now, what would it be? It would be, I miss you and I love you. All right. Thank you, Gianna. I really appreciate you answering questions today. That was Gianna Floyd. Your Honor, next we'll hear from the nephew of uh, George Floyd, uh, Brandon Williams. Mr. Williams. Brandon Williams, B R A N D O N W I L L I A M S. You may proceed. On Monday, May 25th, 2020, George Perry Floyd, George Perry Floyd Jr. was murdered by Derek Chauvin in a malicious and insidious display of hate and abuse of power. Chauvin killed George. Not only did he kill George, but he also displayed a total lack of consideration for human life as he did so. You saw it, I saw it, and millions of people across this country and the globe witnessed the act of hate. A year and one month later, I stand there before you tasked with the duty of expressing how George's death has impacted me personally and the rest of our family. As I racked my brain and thought about what I could say today, I came to this conclusion. It is humanly impossible for me to stand here and convey or articulate the right words that would capture all that we are feeling and what we have felt over this period, 
So please bear with me as I attempt the impossible. The sudden murder of George has forever traumatized us. You may see us cry, but the full extent of our pain and trauma will never be seen with the naked eye. The heartbreak and hurt goes far beyond any number of tears we could ever cry. Words simply cannot express the pain, anguish, and suffering that our family and friends have endured since George's murder. It has been truly unimaginable. But not as nearly un un unimaginable as the defendant's decision to take the life of a human being with no regard for the effect it may have on others. Although Chauvin will be sentenced today and spend time in prison, he will have the luxury of seeing his family again, talking to him, and he will likely get to spend time with them upon his release. These are all luxuries that my young cousin Gianna were robbed of when Chauvin made the, de made the active decision to kill our father. There will be no more birthday parties, no graduations, holiday gatherings, or other family celebrations. The laughter, hugs, guidance, advice, sense of security, and those opportunities to simply say I love you are forever gone. They say time heals all, and while I generally believe that saying, it's challenging to do so given these unfathomable set of circumstances. Before I conclude, I must highlight a few things. George's murder, this trial, and everything in between has been tragic and devastating. Our family is forever broken. And one thing we cannot get back is George Floyd. It is the request of my family that the maximum penalty for the crime for which the defendant was convicted be imposed. On behalf of my family, friends, community, and supporters, I wish to express my sincerest gratitude for allowing this opportunity of expression. Thank you. Thank you Your Honor, first, just for the record, this wonderful lady standing here is a Hennepin County a victim uh, advocate. Um, and uh, as well as well known to the court. Yes, thank you, Judge. And so, Yana, we'll next uh, hear from the brother of George Floyd, uh, Mr. Terrence Floyd. Yeah, Mr. Floyd, if you could state your full name, spelling each of your names. Yes. Terrence Floyd, that's T-E-R-R-E-N-C-E, -E, Floyd, F-L-O-Y-D. Go ahead. I'm here representing my brother. I'm from New York. On May 25th, 2020, my brother was murdered, everyone knows, by Derek Chauvin. The facts of this case were proven beyond a reasonable doubt and three guilty verdicts were, have been rendered. This situation has really affected me and my family. Any family member that has went through this, we are part of a fraternity of families. And it's not it's not one of those, you know, fraternities that you enjoy. I just over this last year and and, and, and months, I actually talked to a few people and um I wanted to know from the man himself why. What were you thinking? What was going through your head when you had your knee on my brother's neck? Why why when you when you knew that he posed no threat anymore, he had he was handcuffed, why you didn't at least get up? Why you stayed there? <sighs> I 
این فکر نه A month before my brother was murdered, I was on the phone with him, and we had a long conversation. And as I looked at I looked at the video of my niece, the last conversation me and my brother had was he wanted to have play dates. He wanted to plan play dates with Gianna and my daughter, and we 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 started setting it up. That can't happen. And I have to, my daughter's still young, but I still have to explain to her because this is history. This, this, this is a case everybody knows about. So she's going to find out and I'm going to have to explain that to her. And I, I think that's to me harder than even just standing here that I have to talk to my daughter and tell her, you know, about her niece, about her uncle, about the situation. That's basically reliving it all over again, years down the line. I'm here on behalf of my family, me, on, me, on sorry. On behalf of me and my family, we seek the maximum penalty. We, we don't want to see no more slaps on the wrists. We, we've been through that already. In, this, in my community, in my culture, we've been through that already. Smacked on the wrist. No, 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 no. Because if it was us, if it was, the roles was reversed, there wouldn't be no case. It would have been open and shut. We'd have been under the jail for murdering somebody. So we asked for that same penalty for Derek Chauvin. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Your Honor, the final victim impact statement for the state will come from George Floyd's uh, brother, Philonis Floyd. Sir, if you could begin by giving us your full name and spell each of your names, and I have permitted you to use your phone because you have notes on it. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. And you may proceed when you're ready. Giving us your full name first. Falonis Floyd, uh, spelled P-H-I-L-O-N-I-S-E, last name Floyd, F-L-O-I-D. And you may proceed. One year ago, May 25th, my brother George was murdered by Derek Chauvin and his co-defendants in broad daylight with a knee to his neck for 9 minutes and 29 seconds. I was a trucker and immediately my life changed forever. I began to speak to the world for George from the United Nations, Africa, Canada, Japan, and so many other countries. Every day, I have begged for justice to be served, reliving the execution of George, while others begged and pleaded for Officer Chauvin to simply just allow George to take a breath. I haven't had a real nice sleep because of the nightmares I constantly have hearing my brother beg and plead for his life over and over again. Even saying, they're going to kill me. Please, officer. Screaming for our mom. I, I have had to sit through each day of Officer Derek Chauvin's trial and watch the video of George dying for hours over and over again. For an entire year, I had to relive George being tortured to death every hour of the day 
only taking naps and not knowing what a good night's sleep is anymore. I've been lifting my voice tirelessly every day so that George's death will not be in vain. Honorable Judge Peter Cahill, I thank you for allowing me to share this today. George's life mattered. So my family and I, most of all, my niece, Gianna. My niece, Gianna, she needs closure. I'm asking that you please find it suitable to give Officer Chauvin the maximum sentence possible charge that he has been found guilty for. My family and I have been given a life sentence. We will never be able to get George back. Daddy's our daughter's first love. He will never be able to walk Gianna down the aisle at her wedding, attend those magical moments of her life like a daddy-daughter dance, sweet 16 party, seeing her out for prom graduations, and she will never be able to have any personal memories with her father. With a smirk on his face and children present, Officer Chauvin used excessive force and acted against his training. Chauvin had no regards for human life, George's life. I stand before you today asking you to please help us find closure by giving Chauvin the maximum sentence possible, making sure he does his time consecutively without the possibilities of parole, probation, or getting out early for good behavior. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Frank. Thank you, Your Honor. Here today, of course, for sentencing gives us an opportunity to speak about um, you know, other matters that I think are involved in sentencing and where we are in the criminal justice system in the processing of this case. As a, as a member of an elected office representing the people of the state of Minnesota as well as the people of the local community, I want to say a couple of things. Uh, and first of all, I want to really thank some of the police officers at the Minneapolis Police Department who, under great pressure, great stress, to some extent at peril to their their occupations, um, what they've devoted their life to, stuck to their oath and their commitment as police officers to speak openly and honestly about policing and the training that is given and received by police officers. Those officers didn't hide behind a blue wall. They came forward. They told this court and those jurors what they knew about training and responsibility. And I think they deserve recognition and credit for that. I would also like to thank members of the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. You know, those agents get called in, a uh, great sacrifice to their personal lives. Whenever things happen, they go. They did that here um, and under really extraordinary circumstances, completed a very professional and thorough investigation. Um, you know, conducting interviews is hard enough, but conducting them in the atmosphere of the city following the murder of George Floyd was even more difficult. And they did so, I think, above and beyond the call of duty. And I want to thank them for doing that on behalf of the whole prosecution staff. You know, I want to thank the family, the loved ones, the friends of George Floyd. Um, they have been through so much more than families involved in murder cases. He's right. It is a, it is a, it's a fraternity you don't want to be part of. Um, but they've been through so much more because of the pandemic and because of security, safety precautions that we've had to take. They have been through 
a lot. At a time when they try to grieve, like everybody does for the loss of someone, they are going through so much more. And I want to thank them, all of them, the family. The court saw a testimony from Philonis Floyd, Courtney Ross. These are people who are trying to deal with their loss, but they have to do it in a very public way and under very trying circumstances through no fault of their own. So I thank them. They have all been models of grace and, uh, and understanding. And uh, it's really remarkable, quite frankly. I'll, uh, I think, come back to them uh, again in a little bit. Your Honor, we have submitted a sentencing brief. Um, I would incorporate that. I guess I would incorporate my comments today into that memo. But I do think there are things that I want to uh, bring out today in my arguments. For hundreds of years, the court had discretion in sentencing. It was the trial court's decision on what a sentence should be. The recognition that the trial court sat through the trial, watched the evidence, and saw how it affected people, informed the court's discretion. When the legislature passed the guidelines, in a legitimate attempt to try and even out sentences, um, they defined certain presumptive sentences, as we all know, for typical crimes. For each crime, the typical crime. But they did not remove discretion for sentencing judges. They recognized that nobody is better suited to decide whether this is the typical case represented by that guidelines presumptive sentence or if there are reasons why this is worse than that. And it gave, and the guidelines still gives this court discretion when there are aggravating factors um, to give a more serious sentence than what the guidelines presumption calls for. And as you know, we are asking you to do that today. As this court found, there are four aggravating factors that we have identified. They go beyond a list of just what those factors are. We have not just done our homework and found a list. The court made good findings, detailed findings about those factors, and we think they justify uh, a greatly increased sentence. This is not the typical second degree unintentional murder. Supreme Court in our state has said that, and very recently, even one aggravating factor is sufficient to go twice the top of the range. Here we have four. The first one that the court found is an abusive position of trust and authority. And the court specifically found that when Mr. Chauvin was acting as a police officer, he had a position of trust and authority. That is certainly true. We trust police officers. We trust them when we need help. We call them for help. We trust that they're going to take care of the problems that they are assigned to deal with, right? We trust them. We also give them great authority. We give them great power. We give them power to use force that individuals would be prosecuted for using, right? We give them authority to um, arrest, to detain. And with great power, of course, comes great responsibility. So they're not sent out there by themselves to do this. They're given substantial training. This court saw all, all of that through the trial in general and in specific to Mr. Chauvin and the other three officers. They're given training on the use of force, the proportional use of force. The force used has to be warranted by the threat. They're given training on de-escalation because we recognize that police officers are called in when people are not having their best day, when people might be affected by mental illness, drug abuse, uh, any number of issues. They're just having the, a bad day, and they're trained for that and should be. And they're taught how to use that to de-escalate and control a situation. They're taught medical intervention. They're taught to provide medical attention to people who need it. 
Being a police officer is a difficult job. We ask a lot of them. It's a profession, there's no doubt about it. But we give them a substantial amount of training, and most officers do it right. This case wasn't about police officers, all police officers. It wasn't about policing. This case was about Derek Chauvin disregarding all that training he received and assaulting Mr. Floyd until he suffocated to death. One of the things that uh, you heard, Your Honor, uh, and the jurors heard uh, that can really encapsulate, I think, a big, uh, a very important issue here. Seven words. In your custody is in your care. And it's a real simple mantra. It's a real easy thing to remember. If you're going to take custody of somebody, you have to provide care. You have to do it in a caring way. You can't simply disregard their care. Mr. Chauvin abused his position of trust and authority as a police officer by doing just that, just disregarding all his training. It was an abuse of that because what did he decide to do? We often are forced in this you know, criminal justice system to infer people's state of mind by their conduct and their statements. What was Derek Chauvin's endgame here? What was the plan? It seems apparent the plan was hold him down until we can dump him in an ambulance and no longer have him be our problem. You recall he said to Charles McMillan, he's a big guy, might be on something. That's it. He held Mr. Floyd down as Mr. Floyd begged for his life. He had the other officers help in that regard. And rather than doing the simple expedient of putting him on his side, he said, yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He was dismissive to that duty of care. We trust that arrestees will be treated with respect, reasonable force, and that their medical needs will be addressed. I'm paraphrasing from the court's findings. That trust was violated. We trust that they will use their authority reasonably. And this was a particularly egregious abuse of that force. Again, paraphrasing the court's findings. The typical second degree murder does not include, does not involve that extent of abuse of a dearly held uh, position of abuse or a position of authority and trust by the community by individuals of the community. Your Honor found that Mr. Floyd was treated by, or with, by Mr. Chauvin with particular cruelty. I think tortured is the right word. We know that, I mean, we've all seen it. Mr. Floyd did not want to be in the back seat. That's it. I mean, that's the, that's the rub. It was the need to get him in that back seat no matter what. And we all saw that once he was pulled out of that back seat, he calmed right down, even willingly went down to the ground. I'm going down, he said. And he went down to the ground, not fighting, not punching. And he was placed initially on his side. He's already handcuffed. He's placed on his side in the recovery position like he should be, because he's trying to breathe, and then quickly placed prone on the ground, face down. Mr. Chauvin put his left knee on George Floyd's neck, his right knee on George Floyd's back, face down on the pavement, had Officer King sit on Mr. Floyd's waist area, and had Officer Lane hold his feet down. You can even see Mr. Floyd trying to pull his feet up. We all are going to fight to breathe. Everybody knows that fear when you all of a sudden realize you're having trouble breathing. It's just innate, right? We want to survive. We know we have to breathe. And there's an automatic reaction when you begin to feel like that is threatened. And you can see Mr. Floyd going through that. He tries to pull his feet up. 
but he's held down by these three officers while Officer Tao is looking on. He later, of course, goes to keep the people who want to help away. He's placed face down on this pavement so harshly that it rubs the skin off his face. He has injuries to his face from being face down on the pavement. He has injuries to his knuckles from just trying to, to lift himself up. And he's telling Officer Chauvin, I can't breathe, I'm dying. And Mr. Chauvin's response was, uh-huh. And all this time, I mean, imagine what Mr. Floyd is going through. If you're going to talk about particular cruelty and torture, really try to appreciate what he's going through. He knows he's suffocating. We all know that feeling of not being able to breathe enough. And he's begging, he's pleading, and he's being ignored. His concerns are being dismissed by somebody who has taken custody but not care. He was kept in that prone position for nine and a half minutes and was suffocated. There's no other way to say it. That's particularly cruel. That is more cruel than a typical second degree unintentional murder. Significantly more. This is not a momentary gunshot, punch to the face. This is nine and a half minutes of cruelty to a man who was helpless and just begging for his life. This court found that there were children present, standing only a few feet from these officers. These children, who were ages 17 and one child, age 9. Why is that an aggravating factor? Well, I think everybody can, can figure that out. Right? It's particularly bad to commit a crime in front of children. We've heard a lot of uh, academia about you know, the development of the young brain and how long it can take. And here you got a couple of teenage girls, a nine-year-old girl. How are they gonna process this? You know, standing feet from a man being suffocated by police officers. Such a stark sight that one of the children even says, we gotta call the police on the police. How do you process that as a nine-year-old? The children were not only present watching a man die. We've all seen, if you haven't, you really need to look at George Floyd's face. As he's dying, he's suffering. The children have to watch this. But not only that, it's police officers, and there are people around them wanting to help. And at one point, and sure, they got upset. And at one point, Mr. Chauvin points his mace grabs his mace to keep him back. How does a child look at that? There's another officer screaming at them to get back. The typical second degree unintentional murder doesn't involve children standing feet away watching a nine and a half minute suffocation of a man begging for his life. This court also made a finding that the uh, defendant committed the offense with the involvement of three or more other persons. Lane and King were involved directly in the restraint and that Tao um, kept the bystanders at bay. I've already talked a little bit about Lane and King's role in holding Mr. Floyd down. They recognized uh, that he was pulseless, that Mr. Floyd was pulseless at one point, and yet really made no effort to take care of the person in their custody. Officer Tao watched most of the, uh, the suffocation and then only went over to keep people from giving help. One person who is identified as a medical trained firefighter for the city of Minneapolis, and that was dismissed, like, are we going to believe her? So they kept trained medical people from providing help. These were all uniformed peace officers, adding to that abuse of trust and authority. 
Your Honor, I know the defense has asked the court for probation. I'm not going to spend a lot of time arguing that. It's so outside of the realm of, I think, real possibility. This is a murder. I understand some of the arguments made on behalf of Mr. Chauvin. I understand, well, no, I can't understand what his family members and friends are going through. I can't. But it's certainly not enough for a departure to probation for a second-degree murder. We believe, Your Honor, that these four aggravating factors and the findings that the court has made certainly justify an upward departure because there are four of them, not standing alone, but in a sense not overlapping, but coming together to show this is not the typical second-degree murder. This is egregious. And this justifies a double upward departure. From the top of the box, which is 180 months, we're asking the court to do a double departure, recognizing all four factors, to 360 months. As I mentioned before, Your Honor, this is sentencing. This is the time for victims, right? This is the time for the loved ones of the victim and the community to have a say. Again, I, I, I commend this family. I, I, I commend all of the, the loved ones, the friends, the people that have been involved in this case for tolerating and, and being gracious. None of this, of course, can bring George Floyd back. That's very true. But this is the time for our criminal justice system to say, we hear you. This is the time for their criminal justice system to say, we recognize that this harm you're going through is real. And while we can't feel what you're feeling, we know we can do what the, your criminal justice system should do and recognize the severity of this crime and reflect that in the sentence to be given. It's time for this criminal justice system to say, we recognize this is more serious than the typical second degree unintentional murder. The four reasons the court found reflect that and give this court more than an adequate basis to do that. Your Honor, we ask the court to impose a sentence of 360 months, commitment to the Commissioner of Corrections. As you know, Your Honor, there are no fines in murder cases. And we would ask the court uh, just to reserve the issue of, restit of restitution. We can clarify that with the family and present that to the court um, for 30 days. Thank you, Your Honor. Anything further from the state? No, Your Honor. Okay. Mr. Nelson. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Blackwell? I'm sorry, Your Honor. Just, um, uh, thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, at this time, uh, the defendant's mother, Carolyn Palenti, would like to address the court. If you could uh, state your full name, spelling each of your names, and proceed when you're ready. Carolyn, C-A-R-O-L-Y-N, Palenti, P-A-W-L-E-N-T-Y. I am the mother of Derek Sholin. I am here to speak on behalf of my entire family. On November 25th, 2020, not only did Derek's life change forever, but so did mine and my family's. Derek devoted 19 years of his life to the Minneapolis Police Department. It has been difficult for me to hear and read what the media, public, and prosecution team believed Derek to be an aggressive, heartless, and uncaring person. I can tell you that is far from the truth. My son's identity has also been reduced to that as of that as a racist. 
I want this court to know that none of these things are true and that my son is a good man. Derek always dedicated his life and time to the police department. Even on his days off, he would call in to see if they needed help. Derek is a quiet, thoughtful, honorable, and self, selfless man. He has a big heart, and he always has put others before his own. The public will never know the loving and caring man he is that his family does. Even though I have not spoken publicly, I have always supported him 100% and always will. Derek has played over and over in his head the events of that day. I have seen the toll it has taken on him. I believe a lengthy sentence will not serve Derek well. When you sentence my son, you will also be sentencing me. I will not be able to see Derek, talk to him on the phone, or give him our special hug. Plus the fact that when he is released, his father and I most likely will not be here. Derek, my happiest moment is when I gave birth to you. And my second is when I was honored to pin your police badge on you. I remember you whispering to me, don't stick me with it. Derek, I want you to know I have always believed in your innocence, and I will never waver from that. I have read numerous letters from people around the world that also believe in your innocence. No matter where you go, where you are, I will always be there to visit you. I promise you I will stay strong as we talked about, and I want you to do the same for me. I will do what you told me to do, take care of myself, so I will be here for you when you come home. Remember there is no stronger bond or love than a mother's love. One final thought I want you to remember. Remember, you are my favorite son. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Nelson. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Uh, it is my intent that my remarks this afternoon be quite brief. Uh, I do not intend to relitigate the facts of this case, nor spend any substantial time uh, looking at the law. The court is very familiar with the facts of this case, and the parties have fully briefed uh, the court relevant to the sentencing factors. And we recognize that in any case, any sentencing that comes before the court, the court is tasked with a difficult job. The court must craft a sentence that serves the interests of justice, a rather nebulous term. The court must take into consideration the victim impact, 
public interest, as well as the circumstances and the history of the defendant. And in this case, more than any other, that likely any of us have ever been involved in, that task is exceedingly more difficult. In my remarks today, I just wish to briefly address each of those three considerations, starting with the public impact. As I believe we are all cognizant of, this case is at the epicenter of a cultural and political divide. We try to keep a lot of that out of the courtroom during the trial and make this case about the facts. But we recognize uh, what has happened as a result of this case. There are a great number of people who will view any sentence you pronounce as overly lenient and insufficient to satisfy justice. But there are an equal number of people who will view any sentence you pronounce as draconian or overbearing. Either way, some percentage of the public will view your sentence as a miscarriage of justice. The intensity of the public interest in this case cannot be understated. I trust that the volume of correspondence that each of us has received from the public at large is indicative of these very sentiments on both sides. As I was informed just yesterday, the Attorney General's office established a website, some web submission, to accept community impact statements. Again, in my understanding is in a little over two weeks they received over a thousand submissions. Again, on both sides. By my very best estimate, since my representation of Mr. Chauvin began last summer, I would estimate that I have received over 5,000 emails over a thousand voicemails, and hundreds and hundreds of handwritten letters. Again, from both sides. And I expect that Your Honor has likewise been inundated with public comment and scrutiny. The impact that this case has had on this community is profound. It goes far beyond what happened on May 25th of last year. It has been at the forefront of our national consciousness, and it has weaved its way into every, nearly every facet of our lives, from the entertainment that we consume to the presidential politics, from protests to conspiracy theories. In the end, it is my sincere hope that when this proverbial dust settles, the community, act, uh, the community impact brings forth principled debate and civil public discourse and ultimately leaves a, public, a positive effect on the city of Minneapolis, the state of Minnesota, and the United States. But nevertheless, while this court may consider the community impact, it is for these very same reasons that the court must turn to the foundational legal principles and remember that justice is blind. Law is built on reason and common sense, and it cannot be permitted to be assailed by public opinion. Turning to the second consideration, which is the victim impact, the death of George Floyd. The death of George Floyd was tragic. He is loved by his family members. He is loved by his friends. And his death is justifiably mourned by those whose lives he impacted. He is a son, a brother, a father, an uncle, and a friend of many. And as the court heard today, the impact and the loss of his life, of the loss of his life, simply just it can't be simplified. And it will take time. Finally, Your Honor, the court must take into consideration, just like it has to take into consideration the aggravating factors, it needs to take into consideration the mitigating factors. And the mitigating factors as set forth by the sentencing guidelines really point to the TROG analysis, essentially, ultimately in this case. 
We're not going to spend a lot of time, again, arguing for a probationary sentence that's brief. But that being said, when we look at the trod factors, who is Derek Chauvin? Derek Chauvin spent 19 years as a Minneapolis police officer. He loved being a police officer. I was contacted during the course of my representation and have had numerous uh, conversations with his fellow police officers or fellow police officers that worked with Derek, some retired, some still active. And they told me that he was a solid police officer, that he did his job, that if somebody asked him to do a particular task, he never complained, he did it. One person told me that if, one of his sergeants told me that if I had asked him to dig a ditch for eight hours, he would have picked up a shovel and he would have never complained for a second. He would have done his job. He was decorated as a police officer. Multiple life-saving awards. He was decorated for valor. He was proud to be a police officer because what he liked to do was help people. And as the statistics show, the vast majority of police work is helping people. He was proud to be a Minneapolis police officer. He served his country as the United States in the United States Army. And he too is a son and a brother and a father and a friend. He too, his life, the, the life he's lived, he's not coming into this as a career criminal with six points, five points, four points. He's coming into this never having violated the law because he lived an honorable life and he attempted to live an honorable life. Derek Chauvin was not even scheduled to work on May 25th, 2020. He volunteered because there was short staffing at the time. I know from numerous conversations that I've had with Derek that his brain is littered with what ifs. What if I just had not agreed to go in that day? What if things had gone differently? What if I never responded to that call? What if, what if, what if? The truth of the matter is, and the end result is, is that we are here after a jury verdict, finding him guilty of these offenses. And the court's consideration should not only be focused on the aggravating factors, but the mitigating factors as well. The Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission was established for a reason. And yes, the court in circumstances like these has discretion to go beyond and aggravate a sentence beyond the presumptive sentences established by the sentencing guidelines. But the sentencing guidelines don't differentiate between second degree murders. Someone robs a liquor store, a police officer is involved in an incident, and a person dies in police custody. The law presumes, the legislature presumes, that the, the sentencing guidelines as established is a su sufficient penalty for all of the second degree murder categories or cases you would see. From 2019 back to 2010, a total of 90 people were sentenced for second degree murder. Those sentences, those people, there were more than that, but people who had a zero criminal history score, more than 90 people were sentenced. 67% or 60 of those 90 people received a guideline sentence of 150 months. So two-thirds of all people in this same position received a guideline sentence. Twenty percent received an aggravated sentence, 18 of the 90. And 12, or excuse me, 13 percent, or 12 individuals, were granted mitigated departures. So if the legislature and the intent of the sentencing guidelines is to eliminate sentencing disparity, the law should presume 
that the guideline sentence is what is appropriate in this case. The judge may take, you may take into consideration at this point those aggravating factors, but you have to counterbalance them, which is the goal of the law with the mitigating factors. I know that this has been an incredibly difficult case for the Floyd family to have to endure. The state of Minnesota, uh, likewise, the prosecutors in this case have endured quite a bit, as has Mr. Chauvin's family. This is a case that has changed, has changed the world to some degree, and I hope it's positive. But it's my hope that the court follows the sentencing guidelines, applies the law in a reasoned manner, and imposes a just sentence. Actually, Mr. Chauvin, would you join Mr. Nelson at the lectern? Uh, Mr. Chauvin, th this is your opportunity if you wish to uh, give any input to the court. And so I turn it over to you and your attorney. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, at this time, due to some additional legal matters at hand, I'm not able to give a full formal statement at this time. Um, but very briefly, though, I uh, do want to give my condolences to the Floyd family. Um, there's going to be some other information in the future that would be of interest. And uh, I hope things will give you some some peace of mind. Thank you. And I'll note that I did read your comments in the pre-sentence investigation as well. Thanks, Ron. All right, we are going to take a 15 minute recess so that I can complete the sentencing order based on what I've heard today. And let's reconvene at 2.45. We're in recess.
Hey, thank you all. We're back in session and on the record. Well, first of all, I wanted to thank everybody for being here and for providing the input you did. Not just the people who were in the courtroom here, but also those who provided written statements, uh, both from the Floyd family and the defendant's family. I've read all the impact statements that were submitted earlier and listened carefully to all the input here today. And it is truly appreciated that you took the time to stay with this case and to provide me with input. I have reviewed the pre-sentence investigation and carefully considered all the facts of the case and the law, but my comments are actually going to be very brief because most of it's going to be in writing. I have a 22-page memorandum that is going to be attached to the sentencing order. And why am I doing it in writing? To emphasize the fact that determining the appropriate sentence in any case, and in this case, is a legal analysis. It's applying the rule of law to the facts of an individual and specific case. And that is why, as opposed to trying to be being profound here on the record, I prefer that you read the legal analysis that explains how I determine the sentence in this case. What the case is, or what the sentence is not based on, is emotion or sympathy. But at the same time, I want to acknowledge the deep and tremendous pain that all the families are feeling, especially the Floyd family. You have our sympathies. And I acknowledge and hear the pain that you are feeling. I acknowledge the pain not only of those in this courtroom, but the Floyd family who are outside this courtroom and other members of the community. It has been painful throughout Hennepin County, throughout the state of Minnesota, and even the country. But most importantly, we need to recognize the pain of the Floyd family. I'm not going to attempt to be profound or clever because it's not the appropriate time. I'm not basing my sentence also on public opinion. I'm not basing it on any attempt to send any messages. A trial court judge, the job of a trial court judge, is to apply the law to specific facts and to deal with individual cases. And so, Mr. Chauvin, as to count one, based on the verdict of the jury, finding you guilty of unintentional second degree murder while committing a felony under Minnesota Statute 609.19 Subdivision 2, Paren 1, it is the judgment of the court that you now stand convicted of that offense. Pursuant to Minnesota Statute uh, Section 60904, counts two and three will remain unadjudicated as they are lesser offenses of count one. As sentence for count one, the court commits you to the custody of the Commissioner of Corrections for a period of 270 months. That's 270. That is a 10 year addition to the presumptive sentence of 150 months. This is based on your uh, abuse of a position of trust and authority and also the particular cruelty shown to George Floyd. You are granted credit for 199 days already served. Pay the mandatory surcharge of $78 to be paid from prison wages. You are prohibited from possessing firearms, ammunition, or explosives for the remainder of your life. Provide a DNA sample as required by law. Register as a predatory offender, as required by law, and then you will receive a copy of the order and also the attached memorandum explaining the court's analysis. Anything further from the state? If this needs to be said, we just ask that it be executed forthwith. Defendant is remanded to the custody of the sheriff to be transported uh, back to the DOC or whichever custody is currently holding him. Anything from the defense? No, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. We are adjourned.